Welcome. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you're all very competent ultrasound practitioners, and you're very aware of the uh, technical developments that uh, have uh, occurred over the last few years, indeed the last uh, decade. I think what we're trying to promote here is the fact that we bring them together. And really, what we should be uh, um, uh, offering our patients is a much more comprehensive approach to gynae scanning. Um, and remember that uh, uh, gynecological disease is not confined to the pelvis. Uh, uh, gynecological disease involves uh, other parts of the body as well. So we need to be aware of this, and we need to be as competent in our general abdominal scanning as we are in our pelvic scanning. In addition to that, our system should give us high-quality imaging, whichever modality we're talking about. It's not acceptable this day and age that we do a pelvic obstetric scan there, then we have to send the patient down the corridor to another machine for a general abdominal scan or a breast scan. Uh, this day and age with technology is not acceptable. So this is what we're trying to promote, a system that gives us a flexible approach to scanning. Uh, we can talk in terms of scanning technique, we can talk in terms of imaging modalities, and uh, we can talk a little bit about ultrasound procedures that have developed over the years. With scanning technique, really, uh, we should have a very flexible approach. Uh, we should be scanning, obviously, transvaginal. We're not going to detail transvaginal because that is the principal imaging modality and everything is really kind of related to that. But uh, um, as I say, we should be competent with transabdominal or superficial scanning, and we'll show reasons why. And also, transrectal scanning is very, very useful to us in terms of... Uh, uh, particularly complex gynae disease. So if we just kind of talk a little bit about transabdominal scanning, for instance, if we take this large fibroid here, you're not going to see that fibroid with a transvaginal scan. Uh, and obviously, when we have large, trans uh, large fibroids, we want to look at the kidneys, we want to look at the ureters. Uh, this is a, um, a large dermoid cyst that's actually sitting above the uh, uterus and actually missed elsewhere on transvaginal scanning. If we take this case here, there's uh, our normal uh, view of the ovary transvaginal, uh, but this ovary is stuck, it's stuck up superficially, and we need transabdominal scanning to see that. When we talk about transabdominal scanning, we're not just talking in terms of, say, looking at the liver, and if you look closely, you can see secondary lesions of the liver there emanating from pelvic malignancy. But uh, here's the breast, a very kind of extreme case, obvious breast cancer. But remember that the majority of symptoms within the breast, the lumpiness, the sensitivity, is caused by ovarian activity, hormonal activity. And we don't realize that. Uh, this is a lady who came with menorrhagia. Patient comes with menorrhagia, she's had no blood test, we would also check the thyroid. And this is a thyroid carcinoma on a patient who came for a gynae scan. This patient came with her uh, left uh, adnexal pain. The ovaries are fine, the uterus are fine. This is an, a very vascular, painful, inguinal uh, lymph node. So this is what I'm saying. You know, we must think a little bit further in terms of uh, 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 how we approach patients and what we offer in terms of scanning techniques. This patient came to us with left uh, 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 iliac fossa pain. Well, the pain is coming from these inguinal lymph nodes, enlarged lymph nodes. Not much vascularity there, so we're not too concerned in terms of high risk. If we looked at the ovary, it was left of nexal pain. We were particularly interested in the ovary. There's just a functional cyst there. And in fact, there's more occurring on the right ovary there. But our color Doppler tells us it's low risk, it's functional. But what we do find, as an incidental finding, we would also look at the uh, uh, endometrium. And we're looking here at uh, borderline malignant changes. So it's uh, an extreme case, but it's a case that demonstrates that we're just not interested in transvaginal scanning. 
We're not just interested in the uterus and the ovaries, so therefore we need technology to broaden our horizons. Uh, Transrectal scanning, I have to say, we wouldn't do routinely, but there are exceptional cases. This is a young Orthodox Jewish girl, uh, and obviously we're not going to do a transvaginal scan on her. We're worried about what's going on uh, around the uh, ovary, and uh, she has this dermoid cyst. A dermoid cyst in a 16-year-old worries us, but it's transrectal scanning that gives us the information. Going to the other extreme in terms of age, this is an 80-year-old who can't fill a bladder. She uh, uh, wants to ex- uh, accommodate a transvaginal scan, and the transrectal scan shows thickening of the endometrium, and again, it's a malignancy. But it's transrectal scanning that gives us this. And if we look at grade four, grade three, grade four endometriosis, particularly when endometriosis is in the deep pelvis, that's painful for the patients. They find it very difficult in terms of accommodating a transvaginal scan. And many of those patients will accommodate a transrectal scan uh, far better. Here we're looking at uh, 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 an endometriotic nodule on the lateral border of the uh, cervix. Here we have uh, uh, an ovary stuck down in the deep pelvis with this uh, uh, paraovarian nodule there. To get that information, we need to do transrectal scanning. So this is what we mean in terms of a flexible approach to gyne uh, uh, ultrasound, and also why we need to be competent in doing trans-abdominal, general abdominal scanning, as well as pelvic scanning. If you look at the imaging modalities that are available to us now, obviously we're all very uh, uh, into 2D grayscale. That's the basis of uh, uh, our imaging modalities. But uh, um, we don't really use, I feel, the modalities that are available to us uh, as much as we should do, bless you. Uh, we'll look at two kind of emotive areas here. We'll look at endometrial pathology and ovarian pathology. Doppler is improving every year. The sensitivity, the resolution of uh, uh, colour Doppler is improving, but we don't use it to its full potential. We have this inherent problem that is very subjective, and we accept that, but we just don't use it enough to uh, the patient's benefit. This is a mid-luteal phase endometrium. There's nothing uh, abnormal here. But you can see how we can actually look at the spiral arteries here. We can look, we can recognize normal blood flow to an endometrium. And if we're examining the endometrium, examining the thickness of the endometrium isn't enough. It leads to misdiagnosis. It leads to mismanagement. If, if a patient comes for a renal scan, we wouldn't think in terms of just measuring the kidney and sending that report back to the urologist. Looking at the endometrium is exactly the same. If we're looking at the endometrium, we want to, okay, we'll look at the thickness, but the texture is very important to us, and high-quality grayscale transvaginal scanning, 2D gray uh, transvaginal scanning will give us excellent detail, textual detail. We need to delineate between the uh, um, endometrium and the myometrium. But what's very, very important is vascularity. We'll talk about compressibility and uh, uh, real-time elastography in a second. We'll just stick with color Doppler uh, and the endometrium. If we take this case here, then we look at the endometrium here, then we look at the blood flow, our very sensitive SMI, color Doppler imaging, then that is obviously high risk. That's high risk changes. That is an endometrial carcinoma. Uh, our 3D tells us it's still confined within the uterine body, but it's the color Doppler that tells us it's high risk. If we uh, look at this case, again, you have irregular texture, you have atypical vascularity. And again, we're looking at endometrial carcinoma. If we take this case, endometrial carcinoma. There's the uh, uh, feature, the diagnostic feature that gives us the information. But that endometrium is only a couple of millimeters, two, three millimeters. So if you have a cutoff of, I don't know, five millimeters, six millimeters, 
you are going to miss endometrial carcinoma. We have images of carcinomas of 1.52 millimeters. There's no point waiting for those endometriums to reach 6, 8 millimeters when you've got invasive endometrial carcinoma before you make the diagnosis. And it's high-quality, sensitive color Doppler that gives us that diagnostic information. So texture, thickness, okay, we'll look at that. But it's color Doppler that's very important. And uh, if we take this patient, I've left the name and the date on deliberately because you look at the endometrium there, it looks irregular. It looks irregular, but it's low risk. It's low risk, A, there's no blood flow there. We bring the patient back, if you can see the date, three months later, there is no change in that endometrium, whether it's thickness, texture, or vascularity. So there is no point subjecting that patient to an invasive procedure when the scan, the color Doppler in particular, tells us that's benign disease. So if we move from the endometrium to the ovaries, we have a similar situation. Uh, a bit disappointing because I've been coming to uh, New York for years. And uh, um, if we go and watch the, um, with disrespect, the expert scanning and talk about ovarian malignancy, their images are lesions of 8 centimetres, 10 centimetres. Well, we don't want to pick up malignancies of 10 centimetres. We want to pick up malignancies of one or two centimetres. And there's a, a failure to kind of discuss, you know, looking at earlier ovarian cancers. If we take this rather kind of complicated grayscale appearance here, well, that's the right ovary, which is fine. But if you look at that uh, ovary there, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. But we eventually find out, we're just showing you two isolated images. But working things through, you know, this is a high-risk lesion. This is an ovarian malignancy. This is a collapsing, inactive, functional cyst. And it's the color Doppler that tells us that's high risk. We, in our unit, we don't think specifically in terms of malignancy and benign disease. We think in terms of high risk and low risk. Uh, situations we can treat conservatively, but situations where it's malignant, pre-malignant or not, it needs to be uh, further investigated. And color Doppler is by far the most important uh, uh, element in terms of taking that to diagnostic decision. So it doesn't matter how irregular a lesion might look, it's the color Doppler that will tell us whether it's high risk or not. And again, we're talking about lesions of a few centimeters. We're not talking about 10 centimeters lesions with pelvic, uh, uh, presenting as pelvic masses. So we can, we can use our gray scan with 3D uh, uh, we can get very precise, very accurate assessment of the anatomical features of uh, uh, an anexal and ovarian lesion. But if we compare that, same case here along the top, with this case here, very similar appearances, but the big difference is that this is cancerous. Okay, This is a cancerous lesion of one and a half centimetres. When you think of the prognosis compared with picking up a 10 centimeter uh, ovarian malignancy, then you can see the benefits of uh, uh, color Doppler in this particular uh, area. Uh, moving on to real-time elastography, still very kind of new to us all, and we're still finding our feet here in many ways, but it's proven to be more and more useful as the uh, technique uh, uh, evolves. If we look at uh, uh, the top picture here, you can see how sensitive it is in terms of differentiating between endometrial tissue and myometrial tissue. If we take a uh, fibroid, compare that with an adenomyoma, uh, then again you can see the difference that uh, uh, elastography gives us. We tend at the moment to use elastography uh, uh, in combination with uh, color Doppler. I think that helps us uh, a little bit more in terms of uh, uh, assessing diffuse disease, particularly in the myometrium. So if we take uh, this case here, these three images here, 
Here's our increased vascularity in the posterior uterine wall. You can see the irregularity here in the grayscale, and you can see the uh, changes in elastography within the myometrium that we would uh, uh, relate, we would associate with uh, um, adenomyosis. Uh, this case, this is a case of retained products of conception, but again, just to show you the sensitivity of uh, uh, real-time elastography in terms of looking at diffuse disease. So um, that takes us down to 3D. 3D, we could sit here and talk to you two days about 3D. Unfortunately, 3D isn't used to its full benefit from a gynae point of view. We've got this thing about baby faces and whatnot, which uh, has restricted uh, uh, the use of what is to us a very uh, valuable uh, uh, technology, whether it's from a clinical point of view, practical point of view, and certainly from the patient benefit point of view, and from a financial point of view. But we won't go there, we haven't got time. But uh, I think you're probably aware of uh, uh, the advantages, the benefits of uh, uh, that coronal section that we can obtain within seconds uh, using our 3D. And whether we're looking at, uh, uh, this is, you can see a heart, slightly heart-shaped, it's a bicornic uterus with a fibrous septum. Uh, here you are just picking up a submucosal fibroid, very small fibroid. Here there's an intracavital fibroid. That's the balloon here. This is part of a saline infusion. But uh, just to emphasize the uh, value of that coronal section that we can obtain of the uh, uterus. It's also helped us to understand a bit more about the ovary. We do not understand how the ovary works. This is why we have this kind of continual misdiagnosis of PCO. Uh, and uh, we do not understand the morphology. But 3D is helping us. 3D is helping us. And you can see that using the 3D, using our rendered image, that uh, uh, we're creating images very, very similar to... This could be a pathological section, but it's not. This is an ultrasound image of the uh, ovary. So it shows you the information that we're getting. We're still very much on the learning curve, but you can see the information we're getting in terms of trying to understand how the ovary works and what's normal stromal tissue, what's abnormal stromal tissue, what's high-risk lesions, what's low-risk lesions. Certainly in terms of complex disease, there's no doubt that whether we're looking at uh, extensive uh, uh, endometriosis, we're looking at pelvic uh, uh, inflammatory disease, we're looking at uh, extensive pelvic malignancy. The ability to do 3D uh, uh, sections, manipulate the sections, use our uh, tomographic uh, sections here, it gives us a far better idea of what's going on. And certainly in terms of clinical communication, uh, it's uh, a godsend. You know, we, we take uh, sections now, send them through to the uh, surgeon, and it gives them so much additional information uh, in terms of using the 3D sections. So if we move there on to ultrasound procedures, uh, I can't understand why the majority of units are still using x-rays to look at the uh, uterine tubes. Uh, um, uh, ultrasound is safer, better tolerated, cheaper, more accurate, uh, yet uh, certainly in the UK, the majority of units are still doing x-rays. But we don't use contrast media just to look at the tubes. It also helps us to pick out other issues. And this is a lady where we're putting through our contrast medium, as we would for an HSS I described before. You can see it's not going in there. It's going down there. It's a retroverted uterus. So this is the anterior wall, posterior wall. And what's happening here, she's had a caesarean section that has caused a fistula, okay? We know that we only sew up the superficial layers now with a, a, a caesarean section, uh, and it doesn't always work. And you can also see how the bowel reacts. And that uh, contrast media goes into the bowel, it reacts. This lady has severe pelvic pain around the period, and it's because the menstrual blood goes into the pelvic cavity. It irritates the bowel, it irritates the tissues. And we'll talk a bit more about this in a second. Uh, the latest development, uh, which has had 
again, tremendous benefits from a clinical, from a financial point of view, has been the development of uh, 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 fly-through as part of saline infusion. So we've gently opened up the cavity with uh, uh, saline. Here we're looking at the uh, fundus from the, from the internal os. Here we're looking at the internal os from the fundus. That patient came to us, she'd had a series of miscarriages and uh, 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 she'd had a couple of DNCs. Normally she would have gone for a, surg a conventional hysteroscopy, but this has reduced, in that particular clinic, this technology has reduced, well, it's prevented 75% of those patients having unnecessary hysteroscopies. And we're getting better and better at selecting those patients that do need that surgical uh, procedure. Uh, you can see here the saline uh, uh, flushing through. So these are parasagittal sections here. Look here, if you look at the transverse section, you'll see that it's kind of a, there's a separation between kind of two uh, elements to the, ca to the cavity. And we look at our saline infusion, coronal section, and that's an adhesion. We look at the fly-through, it confirms adhesions are uh, there. We take this case here, I put this case in because we've got a little bit of elastography as well. A uh, patient uh, with a history of irregular bleeding, and you can see sitting at the top, also there, we've got uh, retained products of conception, which have been there for a while. The uh, uh, correlation between uh, um, uh, uh, hist ultrasound hysteroscopy and conventional hysteroscopy is getting better and better. Okay? That's pure correlation. What we feel we are very good at is deciding which patients need hysteroscopy, which patients don't need uh, hysteroscopy. And as I said, the correlation is getting very good. Now, we'll just end with just slightly different slants. Now, we talked about a comprehensive approach to ultrasound here, the, the system giving us that benefit. But the major benefit it's given us is, or an additional benefit, is realizing what's functional, what's pathology in terms of uh, 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 gynae symptoms. This is a patient that's had all sorts of examinations, colonoscopies, uh, um, uh, uh, hysteroscopies, continual history of uh, uh, pelvic pain. Her problem is unopposed estrogens. This is perimenopausal, and she's producing uh, um, functional cysts. And the reason she has so much pain is because the cavity is always full of fluid. It's always full of blood. And we don't realize that the vast majority of patients coming through our unit with symptoms actually have functional issues. Uh, we're in the process of looking uh, over the last uh, uh, 10 years of patients coming through. And what we've done here, these are symptomatic patients. Here's pelvic pain. These are abnormal uterine bleeding, whether it's HRT, postmenopausal bleeding. That's the overlap. That's the overlap. A certain number of patients will have both pelvic pain and abnormal uterine bleeding. These are others. These will be pelvic masses, elevated CA125s, that kind of thing. But this area here, this area here, the majority of those patients have functional issues. They have functional issues. They have abnormal uterine bleeding or pelvic pain associated not with malignant lesions, but with functional cysts. And the color Doppler, the grayscale, now allows us to pick those up. Uh, we're also looking at uh, myometrial uh, vascularity. And in a large number of those patients, if you look at the myometrium, you have an inflammatory response. It's not an inflammatory response because of infection. It's an inflammatory response because of hormonal changes emanating from the ovary. So there's no point to uh, uh, kind of doing this technique, that technique. We need to suppress the ovaries in these patients. And if we look at postmenopausal patients, uh, we actually looked at 1,000 postmenopausal bleeding patients, and 80-85% of those uh, postmenopausal bleeding patients presented with breakthrough 
of their inactivity. It's a functional thing. They didn't need hysterectomies. They didn't need uh, uh, invasive procedures. Uh, uh, they had transient changes caused by breakthrough uh, 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 hormonal activity. And obviously, I think it gets in the message in terms of how important we feel colour Doppler is. So if we look at these areas here that really represent uh, you know, 80, 90% of our patients coming through, so many of them suffer from functional disorders, not pathologically. They might have fibroids, they might have polyps, but they're developing because of unopposed estrogens, atypical ovarian activity. And these are the kind of symptoms, I'm running over time here, but they're the kind of symptoms that they will present with, sometimes very acute, sometimes chronic. They don't need uh, colonoscopies, uh, laparoscopies. Uh, they need suppression of the uh, uh, ovaries. So when you get something like this, this hemorrhagic cyst that's been bleeding into uh, 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 the uh, pelvic cavity, you've got that horrible reaction from the uh, uh, bowel, this is functional. It's not pathological. So we'll finish there, just as a conclusion. So apart from, I think what we're trying to get across here is please use your system to the full benefit. And when you go off and buy these very expensive uh, uh, machines, this, these are the technologies that you want on that uh, uh, machine. And as I said, it's not just a matter of increasing our diagnostic capability by using a flexible approach. We're also differentiating between functional issues and pathology uh, with greater confidence. And that leads us to a more conservative uh, management of gynecological issues. Thank you.